Hi, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Ms. Pinky Thoughts. I am your host, Ms. Kingston, and I'm here with a very special guest. We have Shamika Michelle. How are you doing, ma'am? Good. How are you? Um, before we get started, um, I'm just going to ask you guys to like and subscribe to the channel. Please click that notification bell so you can get notified whenever I drop new episodes. And I'm going to ask you to check around the um, sides and the borders of this so that way you can get all of my um, social media stuff. You can see that I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Please follow us at ConsciousConservativeMedia.net for the latest posts and updates over there. And if you like what you hear today or any other day, please donate to my cash app at the top and I also have my PayPal. So let's get into it. How are you doing today, ma'am? I'm good. That is great. Um, can you tell everybody about yourself, about your brand? Just let us all know who you are and what you do. So I'm Shamika Michelle. I'm the creator of Naked Girls. Naked Girls is just a group of women who have vowed to live open, honest, and emotionally exposed to remove the mask, stop lying, and just be who you really are. So that's really what I'm about, just living life authentically. Awesome. I love it because I always call you my spirit animal. You are natural like me. You don't hold your tongue on social media. <laughs> and I just feel like I'm glad to have you in the house tonight. And I want to ask you a couple of things. And you said that that's your brand, but is that exactly connected to your political persona or is that two separate things? It's two separate things because Naked Girls represents more than just myself. So I tried not to really push too much of politics through Naked Girls because everybody doesn't think the same way. So for me, with my politics, that's just kind of me, how I feel. Awesome. Awesome. So everybody can be a Naked Girl, whether whatever your persuasion right. is. So how did your political side come to be? Like, how did you become conservative? Were you always that way or how did that happen? So it's so crazy. I always say politics found me. Like I never decided, oh, I want to be into politics. What happened was I put a video out, which I just reposted for Father's Day. And like I was always getting banned from Facebook, you know, kicked off. And then that last time they kick me off for that Father's Day video. The next year I reposted it and then I couldn't get on at all. <laughs> and so I was upset about it. And my best friend said, you only want to be on Facebook because, you know, you like to keep up with what's going on in the city. You know, people we went to school with, she said, start putting your stuff on Twitter. And I was like, I only have 200 followers, you know. <laughs> and she said, no, start putting your stuff on Twitter. And I, that's what I did. And I never knew my views were conservative until it was conservatives that started to flock to me. And I was just thinking, this is just common sense stuff that I'm talking about. You know, I had no idea. I had always voted Democrat because that's what I was taught. Although I'm technically unaffiliated, I voted Democrat. And so it was really like an uh, uh, eye opener for me. So it was like, well, I have no choice really to be conservative if that's what my views line up with. So it's, it's like it found me. I never went looking for it. Oh, awesome. And so when you found it, you really found it and you took it by storm. So tell us a little bit how the political commentary started and how you started making those awesome videos with your points of view on them. Um, Brandon from the walk away campaign, someone sent one of my videos to him and he reached out to me and we kind of formed a friendship. And so I've just been working with the walk away campaign ever since. I'm sorry, I got to my mascara is not doing quite right right now. But um, <laughs> so I started working with him ever since. And it's been now three years almost since I've been working with the walk away campaign. So I've been pretty busy with that. And even when I think it's over, it's not over. <laughs> yeah, so tell us a little bit more. I know Brandon started the walkaway movement as his coming out of the political closet, as he so likes to put it. Right. Um, how would you describe your connection with him in, in, in more detail a little bit? Um, so I think because Brandon is a gay white man, you have myself. Um, I'm I'm black, 
So it's just the female straight, you know, he kind of opens his doors to everybody. It doesn't matter what color you are or what sex you are. Um, and so we just formed a really good friendship because he let me be who I am. It was never a situation where he you know, felt like, oh, you need to be more politically correct. I'm politically incorrect most of the time. And he was fine with that. So we just kind of meshed and worked out well. He never, you know, said I had to stop naked girls or stop being who I was or stop cursing or, you know, it was just be you. And so anytime I hit the stage or did anything with him, I felt comfortable to just be myself because, you know, he was fine with that. So that's kind of how we, we meshed. And that's why we're still working together today because he let me be me. Like I could wear my naked girl shirt at a rally and it was no issue. Awesome. And you said that you found your, um, that your views aligned with conservatism. Tell us how you felt about Donald Trump when he was running and then when he, his campaign started and then when he got elected, how, how was your feelings with that? So, um, initially I was against it. Um, in 2015, 2016, before he was elected, because like most people, I just thought he was a white supremacist and he was racist. And I can remember when the black pastors met with him, one of the pastors were uh, was actually from Durham. And I remember I did a video on it or a post or something, just really condemning him for sitting down talking with uh, President Trump. And then he started to grow on me. So then I would kind of do like little um, parody videos where you really couldn't tell, am I for him? Am I, am I against him? Because he was starting to grow on me. But by the time we went in the voting booth in November, I thought something was wrong with me. I was like, okay, something has to be wrong with me that I like him. I knew I wasn't voting for Hillary, like hands down. She was never going to be my choice. But I, I thought something was wrong with me. So I voted for Jill Stein. You know, people like to pick on me about that because I knew nothing about her. Didn't know what she stood for or anything. I just knew that she wasn't Trump and she wasn't Hillary. So I voted for her. And um, then I saw people kind of fall apart after that. And I used to do a Facebook show a few times a week. And that Friday, we had a big conversation about it because people were so upset, you know, saying, if I find out that you voted for Trump or that you voted third party, I'm not talking to you anymore. You're the reason he's in office. This is terrible. Like life was going to be over. You know, I even remember my aunt saying we might go, you know, back to slavery. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, I was like, these people are crazy. And I had a couple people that were a part of the Naked Girls organization that did vote for Trump. And so I just started to kind of, you know, listen to them. Like we got along on everything, but I didn't realize that, you know, like I said earlier, that I had conservative views. Um, or conservative values, but listening to them, it was like, we, we didn't disagree. We agree, which is how we kind of found Naked Girls and came together on Naked Girls. And I was like, well, here I am. And I liked him, although I understand why a lot of people did not or do not, but I'm kind of the type of person too, where I get in trouble for saying stuff sometimes because I'm just, you know, whatever. So <laughs> it really bothered me. Um, when he would just fly off at the mouth. Although sometimes I felt like it made my job harder to reach people because it's like, just shut up, you know? Yeah, he did. He picking his spots, how he picked. Right. When he said what he said. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. but he never really bothered me. And so I campaigned, you know, for him, hoping that he would be reelected in 2020. Okay. So, um, Tell us a little bit about your idea when you got invited to CPAC and the controversy about, you know, the Carltons and the Wills and what you can you clarify or explain it or, you know, say yeah. it and then redefine it because it created a mess over social media. And all of us out there who knew what you meant or felt like we knew what you meant, we're like just Twitter fingering it up. So can you walk us through that a little bit or how 
you know, Maj invited you and how all that came with you. Yes. So Maj, I can hear, I have another phone and it's ringing somewhere. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I was really excited about going to CPAC. It was my first time. I had never been ever, not even just, you know, as a, a spectator or whatever. So I was really excited about going. And I was shocked by some of the, the backlash and criticism. You know, people make everything about Candace, you know. And it was funny because Maj didn't give us the questions prior to going on stage. Like he didn't okay. say, I'm gonna ask you this or ask you that. So when the question was asked of me, and I think I was one of the last people to speak, I was looking at the clock, so I'm mindful that we don't have much time, right? So I'm mm -hmm. looking at the clock and I'm thinking, I need to answer this question um, sufficiently without saying um a thousand times. You know, there's people sitting here in the audience. I don't know how many people are even watching virtually. So I'm a little nervous, you know, and um I started out saying one thing and then I switched to the Will and Carlton analogy because a lot of times I talk in, in, in parables. I'm a former ordained minister. So okay. I, gotta, I know how to make things kind of simple and I like to use examples, you know, that I think people can really get with or understand. So it, I was shocked by the time we got off the stage, I think somebody text Angela that was some bullshit, you know, <laughs> what? you know, I was like the way she came at Candace. And I was like, you know, I was, her name. <laughs> never said her name. And it's so crazy. Like Candace, I was not thinking about her. Of course, she is one of the people that I feel like don't really reach the black community. But while I was up on that stage, Candace was not on my mind at all. I just wanted to answer the question without sounding illiter illiterate, like I just said. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was it. And so I was surprised. I thought I had done a really good job. Like, oh, yes, everybody loves the Fresh Prince. You know, they're going to understand because the, the audience was clapping. And then, like I said, we hadn't been off the stage long before Angela got a text from someone that was really upset about it. And here we are. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I was surprised because, you know, I thought to myself, there are times when I am intentionally offensive. That wasn't one of them, you know, and so I was shocked that me trying to, you know, not even trying to be petty or not trying to be the goddess of controversy as, you know, I referred to myself or people refer to me. I wasn't trying to do that this time yet. It was still controversial. <laughs> Yeah, so how did you take uh, some of the responses? I know you had a controversial one with J J Jesse Peterson. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, with Jesse, it was just kind of like, listen, man, he wanted to attack the way that I look. And I was thinking, sir, first of all, you, I would never care what you thought. It was my just idea for me to do the video um, and not go on his show. You know, he was like, just do a video, politely decline. So, you know, I listened to Maj's advice and did the video. But I was thinking, Jesse Lee Peterson, you would never uh, have the time of day with me. So for you to be sitting here talking about my hair, you or your little white man with the big thick mustache that nobody wears anymore, you know, I really could not care less how you feel about the way that I look, but I addressed it because it gave me the opportunity to let him know you probably don't even work. You pro I could probably be standing in front of you naked and you would not be able to do nothing with this. So why you're talking about how I look, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I, I think that's what everybody love about you. How have you kept your sanity on Twitter? Twitter is just taking everybody's accounts down. And I'm thinking how I talk on Twitter or how you talk. How do you navigate this climate we are in right now where they're censoring people and do you feel like you have to hold your tongue or how do you feel? For sure. I have to hold my tongue. 
I posted a video, I don't know if you had a chance to see it, that I did to Trick Daddy some years ago. And somebody said, you're going to get canceled for using the F word, you know. I um, And when I did it, you know, it wasn't so, we weren't being censored so much then. And so now it's like, I really feel like I have to pull back a lot because, you know, Twitter took my account down for two months. I had to actually fight. I went to the Better Business Bureau, um, put a complaint in there because I really felt like I hadn't done anything wrong. And obviously I hadn't, they end up giving it back to me. They took 20,000 followers, but they gave it back to me. And now I'm just very, I tiptoe. So I don't even think I get to be as open or as naked as I really would like to be because I'm so conscious now of not losing my account. Um, Cause I just feel like if I do that, I'm gonna be, you know, miss being connected to so many people. And so I'm not as naked as I used to be. Some of the old videos that I have up on Facebook under the Naked Girls page, if I were to post them now, fresh videos, I wouldn't last long at all. <laughs> That's crazy. So you did mention um, Brandon and your relationship with him. Has it changed since the January 6th riot and the controversy around him and whether he organized it and, and what's going on with him? Has um, the How has the campaign and you dealt with that? Um, it slowed down a lot, but we are actually uh, still working. Um, he's doing a lot of work behind the scenes. So um, we're still doing things. They've had to revamp a little bit. Like now they have the walk away campaign pack. So it's been some things that legally they've had to um, set up, I think, a little differently. But we're going to be getting back to work. Like we tell everybody, walk away is still here. We know that there's still more work to be done and we're committed to doing it. Uh, we're just not out as much. So right now, because, you know, at the advice of his lawyers, he's not doing a lot of stuff publicly, but he's still working behind the scenes um, on some things. So we do have some stuff coming up in the fall. Oh, that's great. And um, are you going to the Solutionary Summit with Maj? Are you going down there in Miami or? I am. I'm supposed to. So, you okay. know, that's I'm great. Looking forward to it. This will be my first time. I didn't go last year. Oh, OK. That's cool. Great. Um, so, I know you're going to have some fun in the sun down there. Yeah, <laughs> I love the sun. So that's I'm most excited about it. Now, if it was in like North Dakota or something, I would be like, mm, I don't know. But when. <laughs> He said Miami is, oh, yes, I'm going to be there. <laughs> Great. Um, it, and you're a black female in the political realm or whatever. Do you have any advice for other women or black people or just people in general that want to come out and want to be vocal about politics? And what would you say to them now that we're going into another campaign cycle or something like that? Just do it come out and just be yourself and get to know people for yourself. I will say that like um, early on, I had people reach out to me, don't talk to this person, no, you can't talk to, to that person. And so I would just say, get to know people for yourself um, because you know who they dislike, you may like, and who they like, you may dislike. So that's one of the things I've tried to do is just kind of get to know people for myself and not really count people out because somebody else that I know don't really like them. I don't like being, you know, cliquish. And I think that has to do with my older age. <laughs> so <laughs> I, don't, I don't like being cliquish. I kind of like to um, just vibe with who I can vibe with. And do you have any advice for parents out here who are dealing with the school systems? I know before the show, we were talking about Ooh. kids finally <laughs> getting through it. And parents are struggling right now. Do you have any advice for us to have little ones still? Stay on top of it. Make sure you know what's going on. And I, I'm so grateful that my kids are older because it seems like things are, are changing and it would just probably drive me to drink more than I do without, you know. <laughs> but I've always just paid attention to what was going on in my children's school. And I just, I'm grateful that 
for years, I was a housewife. And then when I did start working, I worked at their school. So it's, it's always been really easy for me to kind of keep up with what's going on. But I would just encourage parents to know exactly what's going on in the classroom, because I will say they went to charter schools, K through eighth grade. But as they went into high school, I wasn't you know, I didn't go sit in the classroom like I used to when they were little or go run off copies for the teacher or something like that. So I didn't know exactly what they were being taught. Being home this year kind of gave me better insight like, oh, you know, some of it was foolishness. Some of the assignments were crazy. And my kids, they're like, Ma, look at this. Ma, did you hear this? So it was like, do that even once they're in high school, because some of the things that I saw this year with my 10th and 12th grader, I, I was just like, you know, I, I'm ready for this to be over with. <laughs> you were done. You're like, I've been doing this for too long. huh? Yes, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. I understand you guys are in North Carolina right now. Have the political climate um, with the battle right now? I think you... Are you, you have a governor's race coming up, right, too, right? We just had one. Actually, we yeah, just have one. Um, a black lieutenant governor. So yes. that's good. Although we have a Democrat governor, our lieutenant governor is a Republican. And mm -hmm. so um, North Carolina, though, we've kind of always went back and forth, I guess, or kind of, you know, I'm in Durham, which is very, very liberal, in my opinion. But um, I don't think we've gotten too bad or too far gone. You know, um, I think North Carolina is still in a pretty good, good space, whereas you don't know from one year or one race to the next who may be in charge. It could be the Republicans or it could be Democrats. It's just we've always kind of went back and forth. Not in this city. This city is has been Democrat pretty much since its inception. But North Carolina as a whole, I think, you know, goes back and forth. Yeah. So um, what opinions or advice would you have for what's going on in the Republican Party right now? What do you see that you think needs to be fixed? What do you what are your wishes? For one, I wish they would have a little more backbone. Um, I feel like they a lot of times are on the defensive. You know, when I think about the Democrats, you know, when people are playing spades and they know they have something hot and they slam it down on the table like, bam, you know, that's what I feel like the Democrats keep doing. And then the Republicans are just trying to kind of catch up or trying to, you know, and then the way they do it almost makes them look nuts. Like this whole Juneteenth thing, I was just thinking, y'all are looking real nuts. Y'all are looking crazy out here. This was a, a great opportunity for you all, even though it was Biden that, you know, pushed that through or whatever. I felt like this was a great opportunity for Republicans. And a lot of them failed with the whole, this is stupid, Juneteenth is dumb, it's for division and blah, blah, blah. I was really disappointed in them. Like, dang, they just slammed their card down on the table and you ain't got no card to slam on the table. Like y'all must don't play space. <laughs> y'all don't know how this, this thing go. But um, so that's what I would like them to do. I would like them to have a little bit more backbone and stop um, playing catch up. It's time, you know, now for you to start putting some things in place. And if you don't, if you just continue to do what they did for four years, you're going to lose. You know, because I feel like for four years, uh, and in my opinion, um, the election was finagled. But, you know, I feel like for four years, the Democrats just fought against Trump, they didn't really build any good solid candidates or any good solid policies. And now we're kind of doing the same things, arguing about little small things or, you know, things that don't really matter and just nitpicking stuff. It's like, come on, put that to the side and actually come up with some policies that people can run with in order to, to push, you know, and if you don't do that, 
we're doomed. Because this, you know, people kind of sick of this the silliness. And have and has you have you seen that reflected in your naked girls? Does some of the political nature blow back on your other business? Um, a little bit. I would say when I first got into politics, I had a lot of followers who came to follow me because of naked girls. They were upset and didn't really know like what's happening here. Why, you know, we want you to just be black power, power to the people, stay down, you know. And so I will say that initially they didn't know what to think or or what was happening or how to take it. But for the most part, I think most people, you know, um, you know, they reached out and said, you've gotten me to see things um, differently, or I appreciate your point of view, or thank you for what you're doing. For the most part, they've still been pretty solid. Um, so I, I can say that. Um, can you explain a little bit more about your Naked Girls Initiative and the book and everything you do? What is the mission, the goals and everything for that? It's really interesting. Oh, thank you. Really, it's just, you know, I feel like a lot of times as women, we don't really have a safe space to just kind of let our hair down or to be who we really are. So that's what Naked Girls is about, really providing a safe space for women to evolve and to grow honestly. You know, we don't really care what your thoughts are necessarily, but you do have to be willing to be honest and be open and, and to grow. You know, how I thought five years ago, I may not think that way today, but what you know is that I was honest about how I'm feeling uh, then or how I was feeling then, and I'm honest about how I feel now. Like, I don't profess to always be right, but I do profess to always be honest, you know, and to be open and to share my life experiences. And for me, when I was going through divorce, I just felt like, and because I was in the church, like I said, I'm a, or a former ordained minister, I just felt like I still had to go through the motions. You know, I had to sing and preach and teach and dance. And, you know, my life was cracking like glass. I don't want another woman to have to go through that and not have someone that she can actually talk to, you know, so I just want a space where women can be women, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, if you're having a bad day, you can say, I'm having a bad day. If you're having a rough time dealing with motherhood, you can say, I'm having a rough time dealing with this, or I don't feel like being a wife today. Whatever it is, I just want women to have a space to be able to, to be safe in, in being honest. So I have that. I'm also a certified uh, professional life coach. And the book, Keep It Naked, kind of came about because people were asking me a lot of questions or asking for advice. And so I just decided to put it in a book, which is called Keep It Naked, A Naked Girl's Guide to Live Life Authentically. And it's an aggressive self-help book based on my life experiences. I find for myself, it's, it's better for me for people to understand why I say the way you know, say the things that I do. Most of the time it's based on experience. Like if you hear me say I'm for school choice, well, all three of my girls went to uh, charter schools. If you hear me say I'm for prison reform, their father was a convicted felon, you know? <laughs> so it's like I'm sharing my life experiences with people um, so they can understand why I give the advice that I do or say the things that I, I say. Um, and I call it an aggressive self-help book because I don't tiptoe. You know, some people like to be swaddled and, and rocked and I, I'm not a swaddler. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I had to say it's an aggressive self-help book. It's not, you know, the nice woo, woo, woo. You know, I just put it, put it plain. So, and I'm, I'm working half about four other books that I know are within that I'm working on, but I got so caught up in politics that I was only writing a little bit here and there. But now that we've kind of moved through the 2020 election, I'm going to focus a lot more on writing and um, getting back to, to naked girls and just connecting more with women. That's really my passion. 
um, families. That's my passion. Uh, and, and raising kids in the way that they should be raised. That's really my passion. Politics is not really my passion. I'm just, I do it because I understand the weight that it holds and how important it is, you know, but it's not my passion. I got it. And um, how has been the reception of your book and how has the testimonials been? Is there any one particular one that sticks with you or anything like that? There's not one particular one, but anytime they say, I feel like I'm reading my own life, or I feel, you know, when they say I'm, I'm sitting here crying, like there's a, a lady on Twitter that's always like, you know, I just sat and read your book and I was crying. You know, she always just talks about how she was crying. And I was really grateful that you know, when I wrote it, of course, I wrote it from my own life experiences. And it was before I got into politics. I released that at the end of 2016. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like Naked Girls has always been for all women because I feel like our experiences bring us together and we have more things in common than we have different. But of course, I never really saw white women buying the book and being like, oh, my God, you know, so I think to have them kind of circle back and now buy a book which is five years old and it be still relevant and they still get something from it, then that means a lot to me because it then makes me feel like I wrote something that was, um, you know, timeless. I love that you talk about authenticity and being honest because at Conscious Conservative, that's exactly what we're trying to portray. We're more political in in that aspect, but we're also trying to be open and honest. There's a lot of games that, that are played in politics and we try to come from a kingdom laws and God in the spiritual realm. And then we try to bring it back down to reality. And a lot of people see the word conscious or black and they just think that it's some kind of black power movement, but more right. It's being open and honest. And that's why another reason I was glad to have you on the show, because you're with the real walkaway movement who was he was open and honest. And then that's how your brand is. And I would love more than anything for us to be able to link up again and hook up. And maybe you can come over to be on Conscious Conservative TV one day or just. Oh, yeah. Yes. And you could just hang out with us and drop some knowledge or maybe an article or something for us. Um, I love that. Yes, because um, and so how do you think now with us going into the 2020 um, situation, what do you think we should tactically focus on? Because like I was talking today on Twitter about cities mm -hmm. and some people, some conservative Inc. voices were saying, just run, just lead the cities and let them fall. Mm. And being from, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I live in Georgia now. I just can't say that. I have family, I have friends, just like I have family friends in California. I have family in Durham, North Carolina. Mm. And so when people talk about leaving the cities, it makes me feel, you know, like that they're abandoning their principles and they're abandoning people. How do you, how do you feel about that? Like how we're trying to pivot for this next election cycle? Yeah, I definitely don't feel like people should leave the city. Not if they feel like, um, you know, what we've been saying all this time is actually real. You know, if if we feel like it works, then why would we leave? Why not try to actually do more work um, and get the message out even more so that these people, that's one of the things I don't like about, um, I don't know if I would say conservatives or Republicans. I don't like the thought that the black community is hopeless. You know, that kind of irritates me because like I feel like if I was able to realize, oh, I'm conservative, you know, um, why can't somebody else? You know how, you know, like I wasn't hopeless. I just didn't know. So I don't like the idea of, you know, why would we put time and effort into the black community that's just hopeless i don't i don't like that train of thought because it pisses me off it makes me feel like you think black people are just ignorant and there's nothing that they can ever learn new you know they're not capable of learning i don't like that that you act like they aren't capable of changing their mind i don't want to hear that you know if i were to take my dog 
to, uh, you know, to a, a dog trainer and I say, I want my dog to learn how to roll over and fetch. Well, that dog trainer is not going to be able to say to me, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, but, you know, your dog just, it, it, she can't learn. I, I don't think she can roll over and fetch. No, I paid you to teach my dog how to roll over and fetch. So if my dog can learn whatever, you mean to tell me black people can't learn? Black people can't advance back black people can't evolve black people can't come to understand things that they may not just have have not been exposed to don't tell me that that's some bs and it pisses me off so i don't like the idea of just thinking oh that's a waste of time what you what you saying when you say that what what really are you saying yes exactly and you and you know that democrats are not saying that they like, right. we're going to turn Texas blue. We're going to turn Georgia blue. We're going to turn Florida blue. I right. don't hear them ever call any seat unwinnable or any state unwinnable. But you hear people on social media saying, well, let's leave Chicago. Let's leave Baltimore. Let's leave Oakland. Let's leave Atlanta. And it's like, what is going on? Right. Why are you saying our values are better and can't uphold this? So what are y'all thinking? Right. Yeah, I don't like that. I mean, of course, if I was staying in the heart of Chicago, I probably wouldn't want, to. you know, I might would move a little bit safer if I was staying where they're doing a whole bunch of shooting or whatever. But, <laughs> you know, um, it's like with, with my city, I do say once my daughter graduates high school, I may move just because I feel like I've been here my whole life. But like, I still hang out in my city. I still um, go to, we, I don't know if y'all do that, do this, but we, our certain projects have um, like reunions. So I may still go to, you know, the project reunion and hang out. Like we love each other. Like we're friends here. I went, um, if you grew up in the city schools, most of the time you've known the same people from kindergarten to 12th grade. So it's like we're family, you know, and I would would never think, oh, just leave, you know, just chuck the deuces to them. They can't grow or learn or whatever. You know, I don't I don't think that's right. Yeah. Also, we have this discussion now that's going on that pro-black or talking about race or our authentic history is problematic and is distracting from the Democrats or it's similar to wokeism. What do you speak to that? Like if somebody would ask you about our race issues, our history, things like that. Um, when it comes to like being pro-black, I've never really said, I'm, I don't think I've ever really said like I'm pro-black. You know, I feel like you don't have to state the obvious. And I just like I'm always just who I am. And um, so I see people sometimes they just feel like they have to constantly say, I'm pro black, I'm pro black, I'm a woman, I'm 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 submissive, you know. <laughs> I feel like if that's who you really are, just be that. You know, and I'm not saying that you can't say it, but you don't have to state the obvious. I've never felt like I had to state the obvious. I am who I am. Um, so I know there's been issues and people don't like when people say pro-black. It doesn't bother me, but I also don't feel the need necessarily to state it because, you know, look at me or <laughs> you know I look like I, I'm not proud of being right. <laughs> look at you my earrings <laughs> yeah look at my history you know I, I am who I am um so I think that's and I lost what else you were saying because I just thought about that and I'm like you know just be who you are you know and it doesn't bother me one one way or the other. Like if people feel the need to say it, great. If they don't, it doesn't mean that they are not, you know, and I don't, I'm not going to be like, oh, she didn't say she was pro-black, you know, because she may. Yeah, some people not, also say, I'm not black, I'm American or some non something like that. Like yeah, I'm black like, and American, <laughs> you know, I am black. And I don't like when people say something like, um, 
first of all, I hate the whole I don't see color. That's dumb to me. You know, I did a video like, what do you do at a red light? You stop. You know why? Because you see color. And, <laughs> you know, I feel like imagine all of this fine in a different color skin. I wouldn't be all of this fine. So, <laughs> so I'm, you know, I don't get mad when people refer to me as black or, you know, I, I have shirts that say hella black, hella proud. It would probably offend people. You know, I have what's <laughs> up African. That would probably offend people. Um, but I'm just who I am. And I, I want you to see that I'm black. Now, what I don't want is I don't want you to treat me differently or try to discriminate against me because of my color. Then that's when it becomes an issue. But just seeing it like I have a friend who um, is very pale. I can see that she looks like she could get lost in the snow. I can see that, you know, <laughs> and it's no big deal when I comment on it. You know, or if I say I'm going to put on some tanning lotion and she say, girl, why? You know, <laughs> I want to get darker. You know, there is no issue with us acknowledging that we are a different color. And, you know, some things go along with that. She's going to get burnt staying out in the sun too long. I, I'm, I'm more fine if I stay out in the sun a little bit longer. So... <laughs> Yeah, I don't get too caught up in that. I do. I see people get so angry about it, but my uh, my kid's father told me stress will make you look old. So I try not to stress because although I want to live a very long time, and I realize when the sun comes around, you know, I'm another year older. But I don't want to age, so I'm not gonna be stressed and upset and angry and mad and bitter because I want to keep looking good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Oh, I love the work you do with women and um, on social media. Is there any other goals you have? You said you was going to write some more and get back into your writing. Is there anything else you're going to try to do? Yeah, I want to try to um, push the, the networking site more. I launched it in 2018 and then I kind of walked away from it. So it was kind of like um, I didn't put the effort into it because I got so caught up in politics. So I do want to go back to pushing the network working site and actually being there and being available for women uh, to talk to. That's why I don't do a lot of interaction. Like I interact with people like you or people that I talk to a lot on Twitter, but I don't find myself like in these long conversations with these random people because I feel like there are people who have paid to be a part of my network that deserve that time, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I wanna push that more. I would definitely wanna get back to writing because it's just something that I love to do. I feel like um, I'm, I better express myself through writing. So I wanna get back to that. And then I have some books that I really want to do. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I was thinking, God, who's doing this now? You know, I was thinking of somebody. <laughs> so, um, I'm thinking by next year, I'll release another book. I'm pretty positive N early next year. Awesome, awesome. That's, that good. That's good. Do you have any questions for us at the Conscious Conservative Media? you have any questions for me? Um, let's see. Do I have some that I think people would want to know? You kind of answer about being conscious conservative. And I actually like the way you describe that. Um, how did you all come to be? Like, did did you know Felicia prior to? Did y'all meet on um, social media? Yes, we met on social media. Felicia had her page and it was Sonny Johnson and she had her page and then Jeff Charles. And so they were all interacting and I started noticing like I was more of just Miss Pinky behind my avatar, just saying whatever. Mm -hmm. Blasting Democrats, blasting Republicans, whoever. But they were more structured in their attacks and strategic in what they were um, trying to achieve with their pages. 
So we kind of clicked like that. And then um, she told me about the media network, which is where I'm at now. And she was like, I'm needing people with content over there. So then I joined and then I was putting my content a lot over there. And then she asked me to be the media director. So that's how that happened. So, yeah, it was just a Twitter relationship. And I did meet her in person and we talked a little bit about it. But uh, Felicia is the is the visionary. Is the That's where all the ideas and everything came from. And she's and so, in Georgia, right, as well? Yes. yes the, um, she's in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm further down south from her. And that's just how it clicked. So then like-minded people and then more people were working with her. And we listened to Sonny on, on the radio. And sometimes we'll retweet her. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how it happened. Just like I met you on Twitter. It's it, it's kind of just just looking at people on tweet, Twitter, seeing what they're about. And then you right. like what they're seeing. And then somebody DM you and ask you. So that's kind of how it came to be. Um, I just like how it's getting kind of crazy now. People are wondering, is it pro-black? Is it wokeism? Are y'all Democrats right? right? So Right. Yeah, yeah I do see that sometimes. And I'm thinking, I don't get Democrat from the things that they say. And it's funny because, like I said, I'm not Republican. I'm technically unaffiliated. But they just, you know... I don't know. I don't get accused of being left too much. I have a couple of times, but, you know, sometimes I just overlook those and, and keep going. Like I said, I don't want to look old. So I try not to <laughs> do a lot of squabbles. Like I'm very conscious of that. So I guess I'm a conscious conservative when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I can't wait till Felicia sees you. You say that. That is awesome. Oh man. So, do you have anything you want to plug or anything today? Because I don't want to keep you for too long. But I really enjoy your time, and we can talk all night. <laughs> uh, just for people to check out the NakedGirls.com. I can tell you've been really slack. It's not you know. I started in 2013, so it's a lot to read there. A lot, a lot to read. So check it out. And that's Girls with the Z. If you use an S, that's not my fault. But it's <laughs> thenakedgirls.com. Check, check that out. Check out the book. Again, you know, I love when people recently say how much it's touched their lives. It just lets me know it's a real, it's a timeless piece. And yeah, that's it. You know, you find me there. I always say you can go to ShamikaMichelle.com, find me there, find me anywhere. I try to, you know, be where I can. And I'm looking forward to the Solutionary Summit. Awesome. And I think that a lot of conscious conservatives are going to be in town so you guys can mingle and talk more about it then. Yes. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad that you were able to be on the show today. Thank um, you for having me. Thank you so much. And we're going to contact you again because we would definitely have you over at uh, Conscious Conservative TV okay. and, and we'll contact you for that. Um, thank you guys for joining us on our show. This is another episode of Mrs. Pinky Thoughts. I'm your host, Ms. Pinky, and we had the wonderful Ms. Jamika Michelle on. Thank you guys for joining us and we will see you next time, uh, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. only in Conscious Conservative Media.